Okay, here we are with interview number two for the Wild Bill Swim Series. And today we're talking to Bill Ruth, who uh, used to babysit for me a long time ago, um, is a graduate of Springfield College. And, and again, the link as we had in the first interview through Coach Sylvia and my dad, uh, Bill Yorzik. Um, Bill was went from Springfield College and he became a high school swim and athletic track coach um, with his wife, Sherry. And I've always found it highly fascinating how Sherry and Bill um, could look at body types and see which sport and which event people could do and then cross train them through the two. I found that fascinating, um, which we're not going to talk a lot about today, but maybe a little for the triathletes, triathletes in the group. Um, Bill in his own right is an accomplished swimmer, all American swimmer. He is an iron man. He's done ex like long with those cross country kind of races, rag rides, and I'm not gonna say them all right. He's done all kinds of cycling. He's been in all kinds of sports magazines back in the day when he was doing all this stuff. And he still does it, which is amazing. And he recently, um, well, some years ago had a health challenge, which we might talk about, might not, which he very successfully overcame. And um, so that's Bill, who's sitting right there at the pool in Boulder. So, Bill, I wonder if you could um, share with us first how you got into swimming at all. How long you like, when did you start? How did you get there? And how did you find Springfield College and that kind of thing? I mean, I started as a little kid. Um, we had neighbors who saw me swim and talked me into going to swim on this team. And the first thing they did was a CYO meet. And I think I was eight and I think I beat everybody. And so I started swimming on a, on a little club team that just started. And I progressed and I was a pretty good age group swimmer. And when I was 13, the Penn State McCoy Natatorium was just being completed and they had their dedication. Coach Sylvia, Coach Smith and Bill Yorzik were going to be there to speak at the dedication. And Lou McNeil was the swimming coach at Penn State at the time. And my dad said, you know, it's like a three hour drive. Do you want to come out and see this? The guy that won the Olympic championship in 1956 and the 200 butterfly. And I was a butterflyer. And I said, sure, let's go. And we went, and after hearing your dad and hearing Coach on the way home, I said to my dad, I'm going to go to Springfield College. And he said, well, what if you are interested in something else or somebody else is interested in you? And I said, doesn't matter. This guy was, he coached the Butterfly Olympic champion. I'm going to go to Springfield. And that, I had made up my mind then Two years later, I went to Pine Knoll Swim School for three weeks just to make sure, because my mom used to always tell me, you know, yeah, you can swim fast, but you don't do anything in school. Uh -huh. your, your grades aren't up. You're not going to get into college. And so I went to Pine Knoll to think, okay, if I can catch coach's attention, maybe, you know, he could pull strings if my grades aren't good enough. And sure enough, between your dad and coach, the coach said to me, your, your grades are fine. You're going to get in. And my senior year, I, of course, applied to Springfield. And I got in before any early decision people got in. There was a girl in my class at my high school that was a swimmer. And she was number one in the class. I found out three weeks before her, and she applied early decision. <laughs> Springfield. So I'm sure coach has something to do with me getting in. Yeah. Um, yeah. Of course, you know, your dad being around and he set the bar. He, you know, that was it. I mean, do we think at the time and my my cousin was an, a 1964 Olympian for the United States okay. as a wrestler. Okay. And so in my family to think that big wasn't outlandish okay awesome. and you know and I looked up to my cousin and then I look up to your dad and of course you look up to coach mm -hmm. and 
it it just inspires you every day to try and be as good as you can Mm. and but it never happened you know and i not that i have anything to regret of my swimming career yeah but but i think that there's lots of ways you can be as good as you can and i think that just in my experience with different coaches and different universities through myself and my kids um that uh, Springfield College and those men, those three specific men you spoke about, especially starting with Coach Sylvia, um, really embodied body, mind, mind, body, mind, body, mind, spirit. I say it backwards: spirit, mind, body. The the Springfield College um, mission, and I think that I don't know about other sports at Springfield College, but I always thought of swimming as the smart man sport because swimmers achieved academically. I mean, my father went to Springfield College in order to become the leader of the Boy Scouts of America, and he ended up as a doctor. And that's because of Kochi. So there's, I think that the coaches at Springfield College, and again, I only know really about the swimming coaches. um, Even recently, when my daughter went to interview there, and she talked to the biology professor, the biology professor asked her what else she was interested in in her life. And the swim coach, John Tafe, asked her, well, what do you want to study? So those are opposite questions that she only got from other people. Like the study question was from the professors and the sports question was from the coaches at other universities. So I think Springfield is pretty special that way. And I think that you and all that group of 25 or 35 coaches that kind of like went around the U.S. are very similar to that. Dave Lang's been described the same. Don Magerly's been described the same. Larry Van Wagner. I mean, all of them. So, well, one one of the things is, I was my plan was to go home at the end of freshman year and just swim in the summer and lifeguard and do what I had been doing before college. Mm-hmm. And you sat me down. <sighs> No, I'm serious. He sat me down and he told me the facts of life. And again, it's the inspiration that he said. And it wasn't coach coming to me and said, you've got to go to Pine Knoll and work at Pine Knoll. It was your dad saying, you've got to keep up with what you have started your freshman year. Mm -hmm. And the only way you're going to do that is by being around coach and swimming all summer. But he didn't say... And probably what I took away from it, Larry took away from it, I know Roy took away from it, was that we taught and coached for three years before we ever graduated from college. We're three years ahead of anybody else when we graduated. And when you start your coaching and teaching career, you have all that under your belt, that knowledge, that background, of relating to kids of all different ages, Mm -hmm. teaching things because we didn't just teach swimming, we taught other skills. That's right. And so, you know, student teaching, everybody's scared of student teaching. It was like, what's the big deal about student teaching? We've been teaching with coach Sylvia standing over us all summer long and all the other college coaches when you're teaching their kids. Yeah, that's right. Right. And well, and that, but that kind of mentoring is, is rare in the world to be, have somebody so close and say, you know, to help you in those, in, in the situation, you know? Oh, without a doubt. I mean, Pine was the, other than Springfield College, Pine Knoll was probably the the best decision I had made in my postgraduate life. Yeah. And how many years did you coach at Pine Knoll after Springfield College? Did you keep on there sometime? Because oh, yeah. coach, coach wanted me to keep swimming. Yeah. My year, things clicked. Yeah. Really clicked. And he wanted me to keep swimming to 76. Uh-huh. He kept, and, he, and, and your dad was in on this. You know, yeah. if you don't get your master's and you start making money, you're not going to go back and get your master's because the, the money is there. Yeah. And, you know, you're not going to want to give it up. Yeah. And Coach say, you can keep swimming. You can do a graduate assistantship right here, help coach, train with the team, and we'll get you in. Because remember, we were getting married the week after graduation. 
So he says, we'll get you a dorm resident, both of you. Yeah. So that pays for your housing. You get your master's degree, both of you, mm-hmm. and training. And But then coach, he, he found me a job at DePaul University as head swimming coach. Oh. And... Okay, so I interviewed for a bunch of other high school positions, two in Massachusetts, one in my hometown, and I got every one of them. And I told all four places I was going, but I was going to DePaul University. I mean, because you think college coaching is it. That's the thing you got to do. Okay. And my mom put the guilt trip on me because she had worked to the principal of my high school and I was going to be the first graduate of my high school to come back and teach and coach there. Oh, yeah. And I went to a new high school in 10th grade. They, they split our school district. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And my government and economics teacher, who I very admired, he came to see me at the pool that I was managing this summer right after graduation, making probably $1.50 an hour and supporting a wife and an apartment and and he put the guilt trip on me that I'm going to be the first person to come back and coach and teach there. And you gave your word that you were going to do this. So the Paul University thing fell through. Didn't, that never realized. And I never regret for a moment mm-hmm. that I was a high school teacher and coach. Yeah. Yeah. So the stories that I've heard from you and Sherry, and I haven't heard a lot, I haven't been around that much, um, are so inspiring. And it's just incredible to imagine having had a coach like you in high school and, and you are Sherry, because it really, a lot of people say that, you know, your college coach is going to be your most important adult relationship in college. And I'm sure that's true. Uh, but high school is also a time when boys and especially boys, but also girls are, you know, they still need to be home, but they're really trying to be independent. And so they would love someone else to talk to someone else to look up to someone else to help them find their passion or what they're really good at. Cause every, it's such a shaky time in their life. So, um, I, I would love at this point for you to say a little bit about why high school swimming swimmers would be a great match to do a one or three mile swim in a lake in the summer. <laughs> well, well, first off, it's different. It's something unique. It's a challenge for them. And, you know, you go through, I mean, in practice in the summer, you go through, okay, here's some drills so that you can sight because you have to learn how to sight and swim straight. There's no black line on the bottom. Mm-hmm. After, you know, you, we've taught them to breathe on both sides. So if the wind's coming from your right, well, you want to breathe to your left because you don't want to breathe that water coming into your mouth all the time. Right. But the object is, you can go out there and you can swim hard. There's no pressure. It's not a time that you're going to be familiar with. And you just go race. Yeah. And it's all cool. And I says, it's fun banging into people. It's super yeah. fun. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, and I think the high school kids really enjoy it. Now, there wasn't when I, I I'm retired for 15 years and we didn't have it. Yeah. But it's more commonplace and I would think the high school coaches would really want to get their kids. I mean, my distance runners, half of the girls were swimmers and they swim summer club in the summer, but they run Mm -hmm. and open water swim. They, they'd have loved doing that for a challenge because it's different than cross country, but it's still, a length of time that they race in cross country. You know, they do a one mile swim, you know, it might be 23 minutes, 22 minutes. And, and they're maybe they run faster than that for 5k, but it's, it's the amount of time that they're at high effort. Right. Exactly. They would, these kids would have loved doing it. that. My kids would have loved doing that. Yeah. It's funny. Cause I, um, I forced my son to do a one mile event with me day before yesterday and he didn't want to go. He's 17, right? Uh, I got to get up early. Oh, I don't, I like to be in the pool. And then after a mile, he's like, can I keep going? This is really fun. So he kept going, right? Did another loop. 
So it is true. They have to kind of try it. So I wonder if you could talk a little bit about what people can expect swimming in open water instead of in the pool. Uh, one thing you mentioned to me about a month ago when we were talking was you might be dizzy when you stand up because you never are on the ground, those kind of things, you know, and how you could help maybe train a little bit in the pool if you don't have access to open water to train in? Well, here, here's a little junior year, after junior year, Pine Knoll's ended. And we don't go home. We just stay at Pine Knoll. We clean up. Yeah. And then and coach found that we had a grad student from Chico State out in California who was on the U.S. National Pentathlon team. And he ate it at Springfield to work with coach on his swimming. Mm -hmm. And there was a, it, Lake Boone. It's someplace out by Worcester. Okay. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure where, but it's Lake Boone by Athlon. B-O-O-M? B-O-O-N-E. B-O-O-N-E, I think. Okay. And I, coach found wind of this and he said, you guys are going surfing for the weekend anyway. Why don't you, why don't you go and do this? So we ran three days. That was it. And you had to run three miles. Yeah. And so and Pat South we, Lane 7 toward New Boston Road. We we were pretty smart about it. We ran with our goggles around our neck. We mm -hmm. didn't wear we ran in our bathing suits. Uh -huh. We kicked shoes. We didn't realize that at this time in 1973, everybody that ran ran sub six minute miles. <laughs> there weren't slow people. <laughs> so when we got in the water. There was a people in front of us. Oh my God, you guys had to haul. <laughs> a half mile. You had to swim around all these people. Yeah. And because it was run by the Boston Athletic Association, you had to have an AAU number for track and field, not for swimming. Uh -huh. Well, we wouldn't spend money on that. We didn't have that money. So we looked at our swimming number, made up a number, and put it in. Right? Yeah, and no and internet, I, so they couldn't check it. So we won the team award. <laughs> well, we fast as we could because somebody's going to figure out they're not members of track and field AAU. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was my first experience in open water swimming was just I was swimming over the top of people, swimming around them, yeah. and had no idea that I had gotten into first place in this thing. Wow. You know, yeah. And get out of the water and nobody else around. Okay. What did I do? Did I mess up? Did I go the wrong way? <laughs> Coach. December of 73 at, at the hall, down at the Hall of Fame when we go down there to swim mm -hmm. with the inaugural Gulf Ocean Mile swim that every school down there had to select one person to race this mile in the ocean. He knew about this. Uh -huh. He was them in the open water so that I would, you know, so I would be like Davis Hart. Right, right. And so he comes to me and he says, there's this race and you're going to go up to it. We're going to drop you off here. And you're going to swim a mile down. Mm -hmm. And the whole time I breathe to my right and coach is walking on the pool deck or not or on the big beach going like this. And all there was was two buoys, Jen. <laughs> Found a buoy. And the next buoy was a mile down. You can't see that. There's little wells. You know, so you're just swimming. And you don't know whether you're swimming straight, but I could see Coach. Yeah. And he's waving his arms as he's, as he's kind of jogging down the beach. Mm -hmm. and finally, I got around the last buoy, and there's the first person I see. <laughs> and I turn around the buoy, and when I got out of the water, I was so disoriented Yeah. from being horizontal without my feet touching anything for, I don't know, maybe it was 16, 17 minutes yeah. to be in vertical yeah. that we're running up the beach and there was a little tidal pool mm -hmm. and I, I tripped in it. <laughs> so I ended up in second and it was actually the guy that won the NCAA division one championships from Indiana that beat me. Oh, wow. And I was right with him, And, you know, I thought, Oh my God, that's probably the first time I could have beaten a, you know, an Olympian. Right. Right. Yeah. Coach saw this as 
a test in the summer mm-hmm. to something I do in the winter time. You know, he's thinking right. he was thinking ahead, but I liked it. Yeah. I, I liked the ocean. And again, we surfed, so we have some background into that ocean life. Yeah. You know, yeah. And down in Fort Lauderdale, you see things, okay? Right. Whereas on the Jersey coast, you're not seeing anything. No. I mean, no. Just murky and, you know, so you got to lift your head up, but you see fish, you see, you see things that maybe you don't want to see. Right. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but yeah. the same way out in Hawaii, I mean, you, you see stuff that you don't want to see. I know. Well, so is, do you think that's why as like, um, as you and Sherry got out, cause I know you and Sherry trained a lot together afterwards um is that how you got into doing iron mans is because you like the open water you were runners already stuff like that or- no we we started running because when you're coaching swimming there isn't much time to do anything else right and my dad saw dave scott win the iron man when it was on oahu yeah i was at a weekend swim meet and he called up and left this message you got to see this thing he says we met this guy's parents at the NCAAs at Long Beach. Right. And he won this thing and it's crazy. And he, so he's leaving this disjointed message. Uh-huh. So I called him back on, on Monday when he, he was at work down at the Bethlehem Steel. And I said, what, what the hell was this thing all about? And, and so she, it just hit a light bulb. And that spring, Sherry and I, bought bikes and we thought well we can do this uh-huh. not about swimming we didn't even think of swimming right because you, you knew you could do it right and we running and there was a local triathlon uh-huh. that the guys and this this jump forward to 81 because we, we trained a year mm-hmm. but the guys in 81 some of them had been to the Honolulu Marathon, and everybody was talking about this. Mm-hmm. So, in '80, they went and did their own triathlon. It was one mile swim, thirty mile bike, ten mile run. Okay. No control, okay. no water bottles. You know, you you got to pose. Um, in '81, Sherry and I set our sights on. Okay, that's let's do that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Still got to coach swimming. We still got to teach. Mm-hmm. And that we figured it was a once and done thing. It was just not like a bucket list, but let's, let's do this and see it. Yeah. And of course I take second <laughs> and then goes and there's one down in Jersey and we go down that one. And we both won. Yeah. We go, oh, this seems pretty cool. Yeah. And the talk of the Iron Man, and then Julie Moss crawling across the finish line in February. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and then the race to October, and we October—that's before swim season really starts officially. We can do that, <laughs> and you know when Julie Moss crawled across the finish line and is crapping herself, and you know, but Sherry's mom thought we were absolutely crazy that we were going to do this thing, so we entered it, <laughs> and the entry was like a hundred bucks, and we couldn't even afford that. Yeah, and Sherry and brother-in-law paid for our entry fee <laughs> so that just set us on that and yeah. it's history i mean yeah. it just so 82 is the first iron man yeah and then so um what's interesting i think for some of the people who may be listening is um so we talked about you know high school kids just get in the water it's fun it challenge yourself it changes it's a different kind of challenge but also there's a lot of open water swimmers that have started in the last couple of years who are older and maybe they can't do the sports they used to do. And I think I talked to Paul Asmith about this too, is that, you know, as time goes on and our bodies evolve with the years, we have to kind of adapt the things we do and still feel fulfilled. Right. Oh oh yeah. And especially swimmers, runners, cyclists, it's addictive. Mm-hmm. The high that you get from pushing yourself for a long period of time can't be duplicated doing anything else. So 
you've got to have something to fall back on if your knees fall apart or your hips fall apart or your back's a mess. Yeah. You know, swimming is fits a lot of that. Yeah. Uh, the one different thing that people that are swimmers or even they have another background that are doing open water swimming as opposed to the pool is there's no sense of speed. Yeah. You don't, you don't know how fast you're swimming, mm -hmm. but if there's lots of buoys, it's a, it's a goal thing of buoy to buoy to buoy to buoy. Exactly. Yeah. And, you know, you can set that as little goals during the race and you can see you're making progress rather than that first thing that I did when it was two buoys. <laughs> yeah. I, well, I did. That I don't think I'd even get any insurance for this race if it was only two buoys. <laughs> oh, yeah. Jeez. Well, lawyers, lawyers change a lot. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so but, what do you think people could do? No, oh, sorry, go ahead. It's important to realize that, yes, as long as you are feeling inertial and feeling the water, mm -hmm. you are moving, you know? Yeah. And if you can cite something and you're moving straight or following something feet like the person that pushes off two seconds behind you that you get mad at in practice when yeah. you're swimming they're your best friend uh, or you're their best friend in uh open water but or yeah you want to you want to be that person swimming on somebody's feet yeah exactly yeah there's no rules like that because there's no it never gets backed up like at the pool right right there's always space so um, so what do you think people could do if they don't have access to open water to train for like a mile race? Like you mentioned a couple things to me once before. If, if, if you're in a long course pool is perfect. Long course yeah. pools like water, yeah. but come with your eyes closed. Mm -hmm. Look, look up to spot where you are to see how straight you're swimming with your eyes closed and use a starting block. If you're going to use that sighting you don't want to lift your head high you want to rotate that head up and then decide to take a breath in one motion mm -hmm. and maybe you do it every six strokes every 12 strokes you find out you're swimming pretty straight you might do it you know every 12 or every 18 strokes mm -hmm. uh, but maybe you have somebody put a number hold a number at the starting block at the end of the pool and you got to tell them what that number is when you lift your head up so that you know that you've actually s spotted something. Mm -hmm. But they got to keep their eyes closed and, yeah. you know, or, you know, in our day, we didn't swim with goggles, so it was never a big deal. Right. But now the goggles, well, don't put your goggles on, swim with your eyes closed and pop your head up and take a look down the pool. Right. That's going to, that you're honest with the whole thing mm -hmm. um and you mentioned something about if you could swim like around the circumference of the pool oh once you, you do no turn swimming so you do a flip turn but don't push off the wall right so it you never touch the wall and it has to you have to keep swimming because that push off is three seconds rest. And if you're swimming in a 25 yard pool, you're three seconds rest every 25. Yeah. That's a lot. It's a lot of rest. And yeah. That's the big difference. Yeah. Distance that you're not swimming. Mm -hmm. And it's the fastest you're going in the pool is when you push off the wall. Mm -hmm. So you flip turn with nothing. Mm -hmm. Or just, yeah. down, there's no lane lines, swim around the perimeter of the pool. I was yeah. just going to tell that because Larry's pool's like 10 yards long and he keeps telling me that. I says, yeah, yeah, Larry, it's, it's, it's like 600 yards. Yeah. <laughs> so I says, just around the pool. Because I says, is there a line in the bottom of the pool? He says, no, there's no lines in the bottom of the pool. Yeah. Yeah. So there's um there's one student. So, so far I got two students, two high school students. Um, one being my son who was recruited this weekend because he fell in love with it. And then another kid who signed up and he doesn't have access to open water. So he, what he's been doing, and I want to ask you about this, is he's been putting like um, an elastic around his waist and like attaching it somewhere. And then he's just swimming. But is that still kind of a point of reference? 
It's 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 swimming continuously. That's that's a great thing to do. Okay. Yeah. It's actually old school, Jen. Yeah. They, we actually used to do that when I was 10 and under and 12 and under. We could hold the person's feet against the wall and they would just swim. And you <laughs> hold their feet against the wall and they're, they're trying to pull away from you, swimming in place until the coach whistles and then you stop and you switch. Right. But with runners, if they're injured and they're coming back, mm -hmm. the last thing that I do is I put a harness on them and bungee cord them to a lane line bolt mm -hmm. and against the resistance in the water. Oh, yeah. When we go to the pool at the high school, we did eight lanes with a handicap ramp. Mm -hmm. Handicap ramps are long in a 25 yard pool. Yeah. What we did was at the bottom of the handicap ramp, we put three lane line bolts so that three runners during swimming practice could be rehabilitating and hooked onto that with the bungee cord and run up the, up the hill. Wow, great idea. Certainly, I had a friend who had a pond at his house. Yeah. Hook himself to the dock uh -huh. in some place. That's, you know, it gives you the feeling of the water. Uh -huh. You're, you're not going to be moving, but you're applying force against the water. And you'll feel if you're not, you're going to get pulled backwards. Right, right. Um, and to get you swimming for a length of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's what it is. It's Well, and there's also a big, I find, a mental adaptation to swimming without stopping for over half an hour. It's... Yeah. Because when yeah. you first start to swim in open water, you, you, it's like you get bored or you feel like you got to stop when you don't have to. Your body doesn't have to. But your brain is just saying, I don't want to keep going. It's time to stop. And then suddenly, very quickly, it just, you know, you can just go to another planet and you can just keep going. Um, we've always done intervals. Yeah. Trained always doing intervals. But runners do intervals but they also do a long run. Right. And the, that, that steady state builds up capillary beds in all those prime movers of, of the muscles that you're going to use that get developed at that long, steady state, not doing intervals at anaerobic threshold pace all the time. Right. And coach used to have us take our pulse up during practice and mine was never on, I'd stop and it was never under 180. Yeah. You know, and that's probably fresh, threshold pace, the whole, the whole workout. Right. The whole an hour and a half to two hours. Yeah. Yeah. Or, Whereas or, when you're, when you're swimming like a, an open water uh, practice, or if you want it, whatever you call it, um, then your, your heart rate is much lower because you're going so much longer. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I just went, 3,000 meters straight yeah and because I knew I okay got time and I want to have a storm come in I'm yeah. just going to keep until they blow the whistle yeah. but again I'm, and I'm catching that three second rest at every wall yeah, um, yeah. but it's it's that con long continuous swim that I think my ideas for a distance swimmer that swims a mile mm-hmm I think I'd have them do longer swims. Of course, we did. We did a 10,000 yard swim for time. We yeah. did a five yard swim for time. Right. Your dad had 100 100s long course butterfly on 130. I know. For the Olympic trials in 56. Yeah, I didn't know when it was, but I, and it's at the old Yale pool. That was the only 50 meter pool around. Yeah. Yeah, that's like a classic. That's the classic workout. Yeah. 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 For New England's my junior year, I swam I swam the mile because Bill Lynch had graduated. Yeah. Coach, it was I think it was like three weeks before. Coach told me to come in late. I did 100 100s on uh -huh. one third. And your dad and coach sat there and timed every stinking one of them. <laughs> and if you got were they'd announce that to you. <laughs> Both would go, what was your time? And I would say, 
101. He said, 101 what? <laughs> right. And I go, I guess I go, 101 six. <laughs> say, no, if you don't put it within three tenths of a second on the next one, mm -hmm. that one doesn't count. Oh. Your dad and him are laughing. <laughs> but so I don't know if coach taught you that I imagine that's where my dad got it too but my dad when we were swimming high school used to teach us to the night before and the day of the event to visualize our event every stroke we took what it felt like and that we would eventually be able to do it in our head the time we swim it in the water and that definitely happened to me so that must be what he was training you for what does it feel like in your body to swim a one-on-one he, he want he wants you to visualize yourself in the race. Yes. So at that rhythm, at that pace, yeah. keep it going. Yeah, and, and to, to feel and it in your body, right? right? To feel the effort, to feel the breathing, right. to feel the muscular sensation of it. And coach did it with your dad and it continued, I mean, I don't know if he did it before your dad, but he certainly did it with your dad when the suppress all extraneous stimuli and concentrate on self-induced hypnosis and that's that's what we do with our mental training with our athletes to to get them positive and because in every race there's a spot where there's a devil on your shoulder telling you this hurts you can't yeah. do it yeah. Hold. and you've got to your mind has to be able to get that guy off your shoulder right away yeah so he doesn't have any impact yeah. and you know, your dad and coach talked about that all the time and way ahead of their time, way ahead of all these guys that have the mental training programs that they talk about. Right, right. So what would you say, um, people who are training for the mile and there's people training for the three mile who've never done those types of things before, do you think they could train just under that distance? Like for the three mile, if somebody's jumping from doing a one mile once in a while, once a year, and they want to swim the three mile, could they train up to like two miles, two and a half miles? And then do you think that would be okay for them because the adrenaline will keep them going? Or what would you recommend for somebody like that? Some new swimmers like that. Jim, 5,000 yards or meters in a workout in a pool to build the confidence that they can do it. Now, runners run marathons and never run more than 20 miles mm -hmm. and we're going to be in a state of what's going to happen they don't know right you know especially beginning marathoners yeah my longest run going in at 83 ironman was 30 miles okay. and 30 where i clicked off every mile at six minutes because mm -hmm. that's the pace that i wanted to hold in the ironman mm -hmm. you know and somebody would say you did a 30 mile run. Yeah. Yeah. It's just, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. I did it on brand in, in like Venice beach and, and Malibu and everything that, that bike path that goes through there. Right. Right. Uh, and I think the confidence that that gives you to do a long, longer event. Yeah. Helps. Um, you know, swim for an hour you know if you have one of the watches that that tell you how far you go for an hour you don't have to worry about counting laps right focus on your stroke focus on your rhythm focus on what you're going to say to yourself because you can't count laps and be talking positive to yourself you're taught you're counting laps thinking god i got 160 more to go yeah you know and you know in open water time is kind of weird because you think it's longer than what it is. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have, are you putting the buoys out early? Um, maybe a day, probably the morning of, I'm going to put okay. some markers out early. So it's a one mile loop and the three miles will we'll just do it three times. Do it three times. That's, that's the safest. That's, that's that's perfect. I think I love loops. <laughs> yeah, I mean it's so last year when I had the idea for this, 
the lake itself is almost a mile and a half each one, you know, one way and then the other. So I thought, oh, that'll be fun. But it makes it better. It's more for spectators. They can see the people turning and it's safer because there's easier to have my safety plan in, in place. So Oh, without it. And, you know, so and to the goal setter, to the person that they, they you break it up into smaller chunks. Yeah. You know, going down. So now it's in six, yeah. rather than. Well, it's one six of a lap going one way, and one six of a lap, or one six of the whole thing going the other way. Right. Or buoy to buoy. Yeah. You know, so if, it's diamond. So right. So you got two short pieces okay. of diamond, then two long pieces up there. So yeah, it's easy to break that into like warm up, and then kick ass, kick some ass, and then cool down, and then do it again. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know. You know, and, and counting the buoys. How many buoys are there? There are going to be seven buoys. Okay. Yeah. And so they, they count them and they know that's that's something to focus on. I'm going from, you know, five to six now. Yeah. And I'm, I'm watching that buoy. And then when I get to six, I'm going to seven. Yeah. And, and you turn and you do it again. Yeah. You know? Yeah. But break it into little chunks. Yeah. Yeah, that's a great, that's great advice. Um, so I just want to let you know that there is one master's swimmer triathlete who is training to do three miles fly. Three miles butterfly. Yes. He said for sure he can make the mile. He's already done 900 yards fly. So he doesn't care about that. Sorry. One of your, I think I saw that in one of your Facebook posts. Yeah. It's, and so he said, you know, I was talking to my buddy. And he assumed I was going to do the three miles fly. So I'm going to train for it. If I don't, if I don't do it, I'm going to do at least a mile fly. So I'm like, that's amazing <laughs> already. In Pine Floor, you know, the older we get, the better we were. Yeah. The, the word has it. And Chip always says, do you remember when you swam 10,000 yards butterfly straight? And I never did that. <laughs> Steve and I wanted to go surf for the weekend and coach said, not unless you go 10,000 dolphin kick before breakfast. Oh. <laughs> so we with a board went 10,000 dolphin kick before breakfast on Friday morning. Our necks were killing us all weekend. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> hey, speaking of Steve Bush, that lake, Lake Boone is in Stowe, Vermont, Stowe, Massachusetts. So that's oh, up near him, up in the up north near him. We we left there. We went to Newport, Rhode Island. There was a big swell in. We surfed for seven hours straight, and we swore we would never do anything that's doing the swim thing, anything stupid again in our lives. And here I am going and doing the Ironman. I know. Well, you know. Oh, and we're so tired doing it out in the water surfing and it was wonderful yeah one there yeah. and we were dead tired and we were just not going to give in yeah you know we slept on the beach mm -hmm. danny albert who i guess is he's no longer with us but he broke his collarbone that weekend one of our surfboards fell and hit him on the collarbone and broke his collarbone and coach yeah. was kind of ticked <laughs> So, so just, I just want to wrap up um, pretty soon. I don't want to take too much more of your time, but last week um, we were talking about one of coaches, uh, what he always said to everyone before they swam, swim within yourself, let your stroke carry you and bring it home on the end. Do you still think about those things? Yes. Yes. And you know what? And you may not put this in your recording. I, I think I said this somewhere okay my junior year i had never won an individual championship i had been second to gary hagan 100 and 200 butterfly freshman sophomore year yeah junior year i qualified first in the 200 fly and i'm sitting there and you know the consoles are going and i'm you know swim within yourself bring it home on the end suppress all extraneous stimuli mm -hmm. be inertial all right yeah all this is going through my head. And then I get up to walk to the blocks and I feel an arm, a hand grab my arm. Yeah. And it's oh, I turn and look and he says, don't give him a fucking inch. 
because you had all the others. I was like, oh my God. <laughs> you said that to me. And it made me smile. Yeah. And I went up to the block mm-hmm. and I went out after the thing. And this guy had, I'd always beat him on the end, mm-hmm. but he'd always go out ahead of me. He was never even at my feet the whole race. Yeah, that was another. That's and that's when you okay. step into that other space. Right? Going, dressed a little bit, yeah. lightened the situation. But I think that we sometimes forget as athletes when we step up to an event that the work's been done mentally, physically, spiritually. The work's done. Now just get to your event and get started. Just like just get in the fucking water. Just go for it, right? So, and I think that well, and we forget that in life too. We doubt ourselves all the time. So, you know, I I I'd use that analogy with my my kids. Yeah. Horse. They don't worry. Yeah. They don't go to the starting gate thinking, oh my god, what if so and so beats me? What if I'm I'm behind? They, they just go. Yeah, exactly. Kids are much they better. Catch the rabbit. I don't know, but they go. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Okay. I'm going to stop the recording.